This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 29 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome everyone to another edition. I am so glad you are joining us on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from beautiful upstate New York. And folks, when I say beautiful, it is absolutely gorgeous outside. In fact, I kind of feel a little bit guilty being inside doing this podcast. And I'm probably going to have to revamp my approach to this now that the days are getting longer and the weather is just absolutely beautiful. Now, it's supposed to get a little cooler this coming week. Um, But this weekend was just absolutely gorgeous, 60s and 70s, just beautiful. Uh, But anyhow, you did not tune into this uh, podcast for a weather report from upstate New York. Uh, I do hope that this podcast finds you well. We are in a time unlike any time uh, in my lifetime, and I'm sure in your lifetime as well. And so I do hope that this podcast finds you well. Uh, healthy, both physically, and that you are mentally keeping it all together. Um, I don't know about you, but right now, I'm getting a lot of cabin fever, and that's coming from someone who, generally speaking, loves to be home. I really do. I'm I'm a homebody, uh, which makes it nice being a homesteader. (laughs) Um, But I am someone who enjoys being home and doing stuff around home, and uh, I'm getting a bit stir-crazy, wanting to get out and uh, do things and see people and but hold on folks we're gonna make it and so i just hope that this podcast finds you well and if you were someone who is discovering this podcast years on down the road after the whole coronavirus crisis of 2020 is over and we're on the other side i hope you're doing well as well Uh, but for those of us who are in the heart of this right now It is tough to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and the light at the end of the tunnel sometimes just feels like a freight train heading our way. So anyhow, enough of that. It has actually been a very busy week, understandably so, here on the Homestead, and so let's jump right on over to this week's Homestead Happenings, and I will bring you up to speed with what we've had going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. So first of all, you may hear a little peep, 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 peeping going on in the background, and that is a duck that is still in the incubator. It hatched today, and so it is the last one. We've been kind of pulling them out little by little uh, throughout this week, and we successfully hatched out three geese, and I think we have six ducks, and I've last lost track of how many chicks we have. I think we've had five come out of the big incubator, and we had uh, seven that came out of the smaller incubator, and so they're all together right now, and they're going to be going actually to my mom and dad's house, Um, so that's where those barnyard crosses are going to end up, but uh, this has been a, a very, very fun experiment for me. This is the first time I've ever used an incubator to hatch out chicks. It's been one of those things that I've taken this as a bit of a learning uh, opportunity. And it, it wasn't a 100% success. There were some things that, you know, in hindsight, I did a little bit wrong. But uh, now we know what to do next time or what not to do next time. Now, I use two different incubators. I have, uh, I think it's a Brincia Mini which is one that we borrowed from a friend of ours. And that one is a little bit more idiot proof. Um, It uh, has some settings that you can put into it that will help control the humidity. It actually turns the eggs uh, on a, on a schedule, Um, but it is smaller. It only holds seven eggs. And so we did have a 100% success rate with that incubator. The other incubator I have is a still air incubator. It's a 9200 Little Giant, and I don't have an automatic egg turner in it. And so what I did is set an alarm 
three times a day, and I would just rotate the eggs. Uh, I put an X on one side, an O on the other, and then I would rotate those eggs. I don't think I rotated the eggs enough. So I think that was problem number one. Problem number two is I don't think that I kept enough water in the bottom of the incubator to keep the humidity levels high enough. And quite frankly, I, as I've done a little bit of research in there, there are some people who question the amount of water that's in there to begin with. Uh, so one of the other things that I would like to do with this, besides getting an egg turner, an automatic egg turner for it, is to actually get uh, something to monitor the humidity levels to just kind of give me a better feel for uh, how things are going. But uh, overall, we hatched out chicks, we hatched out geese, and we hatched out ducks. Another thing that I, I knew when I did it is that you're technically not supposed to mix the different eggs in there. If you're going to hatch geese, hatch geese. If you're going to hatch ducks, hatch ducks. If you're going to hatch chickens, hatch chickens. Um, I went ahead and mixed them all. I started with uh, the goose eggs, which take up to about 35 days to hatch, depending on the breed. And then I waited, and then I put in the duck eggs, and then I waited, and then when it was about 21 days to go, I put in the chicken eggs so that I would have chickens and geese and ducks hatching out together. One of the things that I found is that because the geese are much larger, um, they started trampling the chicks, so I think I lost a couple of chicks to that. The ducks are a little bit more resilient, but we did lose uh, one duck in the incubator. And um, this duck that hatched today, it actually got stuck. And I think the reason why it got stuck is because the humidity level dro dropped too low. And so I'm not quite sure if this duck is going to make it. I actually helped it the rest of the way out of the uh, shell and it it just doesn't look very very good so we'll see but at least again we had success things hatched and i know what not to do next time or what to do better next time and so i'm actually going to be putting some more once i i get done with this i think this duck is going to be the last one the rest of them i don't think are, are viable um and so i'm going to clean this out boy does it stink and I think some of that is because we did have one that started to pip his way out and then he stopped pipping. So I think he's dead and he's stinking. Um, but uh, anyhow, I'm going to clean it out. Uh, my dad brought some duck eggs that he got from a guy at work. So we're going to put those in there. I'm actually going to put some more chick eggs in the Brincia and uh, hatch out some more. Um, but again, so far so good. I would rate it overall a success. And it is very exciting to have... Um, these small babies here on our homestead. Uh, another thing that we did this week is we actually moved our meat birds out onto, I, I call it pasture. It's not really pasture because the area that we use doesn't have grass. It's actually in a woodlot, um, a wooded area. And so there's a mixture of leaves and things like that in there. But it is an area for them to get out and scratch around and kind of do their thing. We set up um, a Premier One electric poultry netting fence around the edge. And this year we actually have a goose in with them. We've lost a few to aerial predators uh, over the years. And so I've put a goose in there and we will see whether or not that helps. Uh, she doesn't seem to know quite what's going on, but uh, she doesn't seem to be too upset being over there away from the other geese, which is what I was a little bit worried about. But I'll keep you up to date on that. But it does feel good to have them out of the uh, brooder and into their area where they will remain for the next four weeks. We'll take them to eight weeks and then we will process them. The garden, uh, things are starting to come up out there. So it's taken a little bit longer for things to germinate because it was so cold. But I have kohlrabi up, I've got kale up, I've got spinach up, I've got lettuce and turnips and peas popping up. And so that's very, very exciting. And we've continued this week to continue to plant some things in the garden. So I've got onion sets out there. I'll put some more in today. I've got uh, cabbage and broccoli transplants now in the ground. So that's very exciting. And I planted some more kohlrabi today. So I'm looking forward to all of that. 
Now, I have not been doing much in my Ruth Stout bed. I have my potatoes in there. I planted a few peas, which haven't really come up. Um, I'll keep an eye on those, and I may need to replant the peas. But the reason why I haven't done much else in the Ruth Stout bed is because I've ordered a broad fork. And due to some manufacturing things because of the COVID situation, uh, that's been a bit delayed. And so the broad fork is supposed to be here this coming week. And so then I will go ahead and broad fork those beds and then start planning in the roost out beds. So excited about that project, but that's been delayed a little bit um, as I've been waiting for the broad fork. And I didn't really want to put much out there where then I would be having difficulties doing the broad forking of my beds. Finally, this week I rebuilt and repainted our egg box. And so my wife and I moved that out by the side of the road. We sell our, our eggs uh, out by the side of the road. We've done that for about four or five years. And uh, that's worked out fairly well for us. And so that was another project we got done here on the homestead. Needed some work. I, I've had some issues. <laughs> uh, last year I had, well, two years ago, I had somebody that, we're not sure if he was drunk or whatnot, but he took out our mailbox, um, hit the culvert, and kind of did a Dukes of Hazard thing into the bushes, and along the way, he hit our egg box. And then last year, we had somebody break into the egg box, and so I took some time this spring to rebuild it, make it a little better from the standpoint of how it closes, uh, some of the trim had kind of started to go bad on it. I replaced that. And then my neighbor built a metal uh, a metal cash box that I bolted right to that sucker. And I figure if somebody can get into that, if they can break into that metal box, God bless them, they can have it all. <laughs> I'm not fighting them. Not one little bit. But anyhow, that's what's been happening here on the homestead this week. Very busy, just loving this time of the year, really enjoying all of the baby animals, uh, enjoying watching the garden starting to come to life, and just really looking forward to enjoying the abundance here on the homestead uh, that we'll, we will enjoy in spite of COVID. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. Back on episode number 18, we spent some time talking about raising chickens for meat. And we talked about the various options that you have for doing that. But for some homesteaders, none of those options are an option. Maybe you simply don't have the land necessary to raise chickens, or maybe you live in a suburban area or an HOA where you're not allowed to have animals, or at least not allowed to have chickens. Is there something else that you can do? Is there another animal that you can raise in order to be able to generate protein for your family? On this episode, I want to spend some time talking about why you might want to consider raising rabbits for meat. Now, that's something that we've done here on our homestead, although to be quite frank with you, it wasn't something that my wife and I ever planned on doing. And so let me share with you some of the benefits of raising meat rabbits, and then let me share with you a little bit about our journey into raising meat rabbits and some of the lessons that we learned along the way that hopefully will help you as you try to decide whether or not meat rabbits might be a good fit for your homestead. Now, the fact of the matter is, it's not a very common source of protein in the United States. Um, it's very common in certain parts of Europe, but here in the U.S., it's not as common as maybe it used to be, or at least as it is now in other parts of the world. But rabbit is a very, very great source of protein. And so even if you are raising other animals, maybe you do have the land to raise other livestock. You've raised meat chickens, you're raising standard breed chickens, you're raising um, maybe goats and sheep and maybe even beef cattle. Uh, you may still want to consider meat rabbits for your homestead. And so let me share with you some of the benefits of raising meat rabbits 
and hopefully it will at least get you to thinking about potentially adding them as a source of protein to your homestead. So why consider raising me rabbits? Well, first of all, there is a very, very small space requirement for meat rabbits. Now you can raise them in a number of different ways. You can raise them in tractors that you kind of move around your yard, kind of like chicken tractors. Uh, but they're commonly raised either in hutches or in cages. Uh, and those cages can be on a back porch or in a garage. So if you live in an area where you're not allowed to have chickens, or you live in an HOA where you're not allowed to have hardly any animals whatsoever, you can kind of raise rabbits a little bit on the down low because there's not a lot of room that's required. And you could put a cage on your back porch and there are cages specifically built for those kinds of situations where there's what's called a poop tray at the bottom, which will catch the poop in the urine and you empty it every day or whatever. And But you can keep these in a stack of cages on your back porch. Or some people will, again, hang them in their garage. But this is something that you could even do in an HOA. So there's a very, very small space requirement with meat rabbits. The second thing is that there is very little noise from rabbits. Obviously, they don't cackle, they don't crow, they don't moo, they don't oink, they don't do any kind, any of those kinds of things. And so again, you can be a little bit more stealthy with these animals and maybe kind of sneak them in Again, they're smaller, so people aren't going to see, you're, you're, if you've got that neighbor, that Karen that lives next door who's always tattling to the HOA about everything that you do wrong, well, you can kind of sneak a little rabbit maybe in the back door. Now, maybe sneaking the cage in the back door might be a little bit more of a challenge, but, you know, get creative. Wait till Karen is out of town. Right now, maybe it's a little more difficult because Karen is stuck home all the time, um, but there are things that you can do to kind of Keep it on the down low, sneak that rabbit in the back door, and, uh, or, well, you're gonna need more than one. You're gonna need at least a buck and a doe, because, you know, you gotta have the, the boy girl relationship there. Uh, if you're gonna have a continuous source of meat. Um, but again, they don't, they create very little noise. Now, one caveat to that is when you go to butcher them, if you don't get a clean kill, um, or even sometimes just because of the fact that they don't like being handled, they can scream and it is very unnerving. So just keep that in mind. But by and large, there is almost virtually no noise whatsoever from rabbits. Uh, and so that is another consideration. Rabbits are also prolific breeders. There is a reason why people use the term breed like rabbits. <laughs> As I will share with you in a little bit, it is no joke. We learned a lot about bunny math uh, when we first got into rabbits. Now, we certainly did not uh, breed our rabbits to this level, but according to the Mother Earth News uh, article that I, again, am linking in the show notes, a pair of does can generate over 600 pounds of meat per year. That is actually more than a yearling steer, which usually would have a carcass weight probably around 400 pounds. So a pair of does, according to the Mother Earth News article, can generate 600 pounds of meat. Now again, we did not breed our rabbits to that level. Um, I think we, when we were doing them at the height of our rabbit breeding uh, enterprise, I think I was doing maybe two or three litters a year. Um, but Again, it is possible to generate that much meat. If they are managed correctly, there is very little smell from rabbits. Rabbit poop does not stink hardly whatsoever at all. Um, their urine can be a little smelly, but again, if you manage it correctly, uh, there is very little smell from rabbits. Not only does rabbit manure virtually not stink, but it is also great stuff for your garden. Uh, it is not a hot manure. In other words, it doesn't need to be composted before you put it on your garden. You can go ahead and take it right out from underneath the rabbits, dump it right on your garden, and it will do awesome. It will do wonders for your garden. In fact, I remember as kids, some of the best tomatoes my mom and dad ever grew 
was with rabbit manure. It is awesome stuff for your garden, a huge benefit to raising rabbits. Another reason why you might want to consider raising meat rabbits is the feed conversion ratio is very, very similar to the Cornish cross. Now, the Cornish cross, depending on who you read, a pastured uh, Cornish cross is going to take anywhere from about three to four pounds of feed for one pound of finished product. Sometimes it's a little less, sometimes it's a little bit more, but somewhere in that three to four pound ratio. Now, the big ag guys claim like less than two pounds per one pound of finished um, product, but for most of us that are keeping them on pasture, um, it's somewhere in that neighborhood of three to four pounds on a Cornish cross. And rabbits are very, very similar in that regard. If you are using a pelleted feed with rabbits, again, depending on the breed and, and there's other you know, other considerations, um, but you would be looking at about a three to four pounds of feed per one pound of finished product. Now, um, just kind of also uh, by way of full transparency, some of these numbers that I'm getting here are coming from a couple of articles that I will link in the show notes. One comes from meatscience.org and there's another article from Mother Earth News. So I'll make sure that I link to those in the show notes. But again, that seems to be the general consensus is that it's about three to four pounds uh, per uh of a feed conversion ratio for a, a pound of finished rabbit meat. Now, another benefit of raising meat rabbits is it's a similar length of time to reach butchering weight. So depending on the breed, at about eight to 10 weeks, you can have a four to five pound carcass. Um, my meat rabbits were never that, uh, didn't, didn't reach that size that quickly, but that's because my stock wasn't as good as it could have been. So mine, it took about 12 weeks, but again, about eight to 12 weeks, but you say eight to 10, if you've got good stock, that's right in there with the amount of commitment that it takes to raise meat birds. Another reason why you may want to consider raising meat rabbits is that they can be raised exclusively on pasture. Now, if you raise them exclusively on pasture and you've got tractors and you're moving them around a field or whatever, it will take longer for them to reach butchering weight. Based on the information that I found in the Mother Earth News article, uh, the um, experiments that, that the people there did, uh, they said it took about 26 to 28 weeks for them to reach butchering weight versus 12 weeks on a pelleted feed. But again, if you're in a situation where it's all falling apart, we can't get pelleted feed, it's nice to know that we can have a food supply, a protein source that can be raised exclusively on pasture, or you could keep them in cages and bring grass and hay and things like that to them. It's just going to take a little longer for them to be able to reach butchering weight. Now, there are people that also raise them on fodder. Um, fodder is where you take and you sprout grains in trays. Um, there's a whole system that you can read up on that. I tried doing fodder a couple of years ago, and I never had much success with being able to raise fodder out without getting mold. And that's a big part of the problem with certain fodder systems. And one of the things with rabbits is their digestive system is a little bit more sensitive. And so while you could feed something moldy to a chicken, they're like God's garbage disposal, you wouldn't want to do that with a rabbit, but there are people who successfully raise rabbits on fodder. Another benefit to raising meat rabbits is that they taste like chicken. Now, one of the things that it does irritate me is when people say, well, it's great, it tastes like chicken. Well, if I wanted something to taste like chicken, I would order chicken. Let me just put it out there. You know, some people will say, well, that fish is so awesome, it tastes like chicken. Well, no, if I wanted chicken, I'd order chicken. When I eat fish, I want my fish to taste like fish. But having said that, there is a benefit a benefit to rabbit tasting like chicken, and that's that people don't need to develop or acquire a taste for it. You know, goat and lamb, 
that's a bit of an acquired taste. Not everybody enjoys the flavor of those uh, those animals. Venison is something else that not everybody enjoys uh, the flavor of venison. Now, some of that has to do with how it's cooked, but many meats like that, especially ones that we have not been accustomed to eating, are a bit of an acquired taste. Rabbit tastes just like chicken. Now, it's a little bit leaner. It, it's more like breast meat can end up being a little bit more dry because it doesn't have the fat that chicken has. But you can use rabbit as a substitute in many ch chicken dishes, and most people would be none the wiser. You know, you could do chicken tetrazzini and put rabbit in there. Now you've got rabbit tetrazzini. You could do chicken quesadillas, but put rabbit in there. You've got rabbit quesadillas. Now you can certainly just cook rabbit straight up, marinate it, put it on the grill. It's awesome. Hassan pfeffer is delightful. My wife would take rabbit and put it in an instant pot with some of our home canned tomatoes, our stewed tomatoes, and kind of make this, uh, put some Italian season in there and kind of make this rabbit stew almost that we would serve over mashed potatoes. Amazing. But it tastes like chicken. It was kind of like a stewed chicken, except it was rabbit. Um, so, but it is much leaner than chicken, much leaner than anything else. So you do need to keep that in mind, but it is a benefit to it that it tastes like chicken. The last reason why I would recommend raising or considering rabbits uh, as a meat source is that they're really easy to process. Now, they're easy to process, but they're also hard to process. We'll talk about the hard to process here in a minute, but they're easy to process from the standpoint of you, you, when you go to process a, a, a chicken, you've got to scald it, you've got to put in a plucker and all those kinds of things. With a meat rabbit, basically what you're doing is you're pulling the skin down and it just comes down really, really fast. You got it, you're done. Um, they're, they're very, very easy to process and they are much cleaner than a chicken. They're a cleaner animal to begin with. Now you do need to be careful that you're not getting hair all over the meat, but it's just, in my opinion, from my experience of processing rabbits, it's a much cleaner process than that of butchering chickens. Now there are some downsides to rabbits. The first is they're cute. They are cute little beggars. When you go to process a meat bird, and, and folks, I don't want this to sound harsh because I, I don't take it lightly. Anytime I take the life of an animal, I, I treat it with respect and I don't take that act lightly at all. But with Cornish cross birds, when it comes time to process them, there's almost a sense to where you are, <laughs> it's a mercy killing. You're putting them out of their misery because those things are so big and they've grown so big so fast they can hardly get around. With rabbits, they are just cute little beggars. And so quite frankly, folks, when I say it's easy to process a rabbit, I'm saying that from the standpoint of the mechanics of processing a rabbit. But processing a rabbit, at least for me, was a lot more difficult emotionally than processing chickens. And so if that is going to be the first animal that you ever process on your homestead, it, it's going to suck. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's not easy. Even even if, if a meat bird is the first animal you process it, it's not going to be easy. I'm not trying to make light of it. But certainly processing rabbits is going to be difficult. If you can't process them yourself because it's not a common thing, then it may be a little bit more difficult for you to find someone else to process them for you versus processing poultry. And when you find someone to process them for you, it may cost you, it probably will cost you more than a chicken to process them. If you decide that you want to raise them to sell for meat, you also may find that it's harder to develop a market for rabbit because it's not as common of a protein to consume. So just keep that in mind. And then some of the regulations surrounding uh, processing rabbits, it's just a little bit more of a gray area and because it's not as common, uh, a common thing to eat. And so depending on where you live, 
it may be a little bit more difficult to be able to process them and sell them legally. Here in New York, from my understanding of the regulations, I can legally process and sell 1,000 chickens on my farm direct to consumers. I cannot legally process and sell one rabbit. I have to take them to a processor if I want to sell them legally to someone else. Now, there are certain ways that it's kind of a gray area to get around that. Not going to get into that. But if you decide that you want to raise them commercially, just keep that in mind. Look into the rules and regulations before you put in a whole lot of infrastructure to try to support that. Another downside to raising rabbits is that if organic non-GMO is important to you, it may be harder to source a pelleted food like that. Um, just because, again, not a lot of, not as many people are doing that as uh, are raising organic and non-GMO meat birds. And finally, uh, another downside to raising rabbits is that they are notoriously difficult to sex. Uh, to try to tell a boy from a girl sometimes is, it's, it's an art form. And there are many people who have been doing this for a very, very long time who have been tricked. And they thought that they had a boy and it co come to find out it was a girl or vice versa. Which isn't that big of a deal except if you've got your grow outs together and you go let them go a little bit too long and you have a boy in with your girls, now all of a sudden you have little baby bunnies maybe on the way that you weren't aware of. And so if you go to process a rabbit and you find out that she's pregnant, that is something, again, that's a little bit more uh, emotional. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Rabbits are a little bit more difficult to sex. So having said all of that, let me just quickly share with you our journey into rabbits. We did not, as I said earlier, my wife and I had no designs of raising rabbits on our homestead. What happened is my dad decided to get back into raising meat rabbits. Now, we had done this when I was really, really young. I think I was in like kindergarten through like first or second grade. My mom and dad raised meat rabbits until the neighbor's dogs got into the hutches and killed them. And then that was the end of us raising meat rabbits. So for me, the idea, the concept of raising meat rabbits certainly wasn't foreign. Um, but again, it wasn't something that I had ever planned on doing here on our homestead. But my dad decided to get back into raising meat rabbits. Somebody gave him a doe and two kits. Now, kits are baby rabbits. And so my dad brought them home to his house in a metal dog crate because he didn't have his hutch built yet. And then shortly thereafter, he had started to build the hutch, but it wasn't anywhere near complete. He and my mom were going to go visit my brother in Texas, and they asked us if we would watch their rabbits for 10 days while they went to Texas. And we said, sure, no problem. And so they brought the rabbits down in that metal dog crate. And we just kind of left it outside. There was no base in that dog crate so they could kind of eat the grass. And sometimes I wouldn't move it enough and they would start to dig holes in my yard. But I just kind of moved it around the yard and the rabbits were outside and we were feeding them pellets. Well, my dad and mom came back from Texas and they never came and got the rabbits. And my dad kind of never got around to finishing up his hutch. And so here we were babysitting these rabbits for a lot longer than we had anticipated. And winter was coming on quickly, and so I realized that my dad wasn't going to come get his rabbits uh, as quickly as he had said. And so I threw together a hutch out of some scraps that we had laying around, and we put all three rabbits in a single cage up off the ground, and we went on with life. Well, come to find out, one of those kits was a boy. Again, I didn't know how to tell which were boys and which were girls. But what I did know is that periodically throughout the winter, my wife would come in the house upset because another litter of babies had been born on the wire and they had frozen. And of course, this was something that was very, very emotional to my wife. Now, why was my wife taking care of my dad's rabbits? Why wasn't I doing that? Well, that's a great question. And I really don't have a good answer for that except to say that my wife is a saint. 
And so my wife throughout the winter was taking care of these rabbits and periodically again she would go outside and there would be these dead baby bunnies and it was just building and building. The emotions of all of this were building throughout the winter and she was just getting increasingly frustrated with the whole situation. Well, in early spring, I started to see that the one rabbit was starting to pull her hair. The mom was white, one of the kits was gray, and one of the kits was black. I knew the mom was the adult, the mom obviously was a female, and I started seeing white hair being pulled, and so I knew that that meant that she was getting ready to build a nest, because that's what rabbits do when it's coming time for them to give birth, is they will pull their hair out and start building a little nest for the kits. And so I moved this mom into another cage where I had put in a crudely built nesting box and she had a litter of 12 bunnies. And so I was very happy. These were the first babies ever born on our homestead. And they were, well, initially baby bunnies are ugly, but as they start growing out, they really become very, very, very cute. And then it wasn't very long and I started seeing some gray hair getting pulled. So I'm like, all right, process of elimination. We now know that the black bunny is the boy bunny. And so I pulled him out of the hutch so that the um, mom could have, or the gray bunny could have um, a nesting area. And I put him in a crate right next to the original mom. And the gray bunny had 12 more. So now here we had gone from three to 24 and three, 27 bunnies, bam, like that. So now I'm realizing, well, I'm in this rabbit game pretty deep here, so I need to find some cages. And so I found some cages on Craigslist. I went and I bought them. And as I was loading them up, the guy who was selling them to me, one of the cages was a double. And what that means is it's one cage, there's a divider in between, so that you have, you can have two rabbits in this one cage. And he said to me, he said, you don't want to put a male and a female in this double because they've been known to breed through the wire. Now, I, I, I nodded my head to him. I didn't roll my eyes to him physically, but internally I was rolling my eyes big time and I was saying, yeah, 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 whatever. Don't buy it one little bit. And I loaded these rabbit cages up and I brought them home. And I was unloading them and I thought, well, maybe it's time for me to take a look at the original mom, the white bunny, and see how she's doing. Now, this was almost a month after she had had uh, her first litter. One of the things to keep in mind also with rabbits is their gestation period is 28 days. Okay, so keep that in mind. Every 28 days, they can have a litter and they can be bred back right away. So you can have a litter in 28 days and she could have another litter in 28 days. And yeah, I mean, it's like when people talk about breeding like bunnies, that ain't no joke. So I look in and I see these kits that were about a month old are kind of, you know, jumping all over. And I'm thinking, well, they're cute. And maybe I should take the nesting box out now to give them a little bit more room in the cage. Well, as I went to do that, I happened to look in the nesting box and I see movement. What in the world could that be? That buck had bred that doe again through the wire because I had them right next to each other. And she had had another 13 kits. So now here we were at what? 27 and 13. What's that? 40? 40 rabbits? How in the world? And I'm the one that now has to go tell my wife, who had been increasingly frustrated with this whole situation all winter long, that we have another 13 mouths to feed. At this point, she happened to be at the grocery store. So I thought, well, I've got a little bit of time. Let me figure out how I'm going to break this news to her. So I went up to the garden. I was doing some work in the garden, weeding or something up there. And she pulls into the driveway. And to get back to our house, you kind of have to drive by the garden to get to the back of the house where the rabbits were. And so she pulls in and she rolled the windows down and she had a big smile on her face and she said, I came back and said, well, um, why don't you go see Brian J? He's got something to show you. <laughs> and then I waited. And about five minutes later, I hear, no! No! 
and I walked down to where the rabbits were and my wife was, I don't know as I've ever seen her that angry. She was so mad she could have chewed up roofing and spit out 10 penny nails. I'm confident of that. I'm going to box these rabbits up. I'm going to put them on your dad's doorsteps. I didn't want these darn things to begin with. I mean, she was furious and quite frankly, rightfully so. Uh, and I, in hindsight, I should have been the one. I shouldn't have hidden behind my son and had him break the news to her. But that is what I did. But folks, that was our introduction into rabbits. And we continued. Uh, my wife eventually got um, over it. My dad eventually came and got his three original rabbits back and uh, and left the other ones for us to raise, which we did raise and we learned how to process and we put them in our freezer and we learned how to cook them. And um, and we did that for several years up until about uh, two years ago. Um, and uh, my buck died, I think, from old age. And so now I have two freeloading does that I just have not had the heart to send over the rainbow. But I didn't get another buck because there were some lessons that we learned from, from our original foray into rabbits. Number one is we learned that we did not have the best stock possible. I have no idea what type of rabbit these were, but what I do know is they were not very feed efficient. It took about 12 weeks for them to reach butchering weight. And even then, I was butchering rabbits at about three pounds. Um, so if you want a four to five pound rabbit, I would have had to push them even further, which would be more feed. And again, that affects that feed conversion ratio. So I certainly was not happy with the quality of stock that I had. Um, and so my goal and part of the goal of our homestead here is to raise heritage breeds anyhow. And so what I want to do is pivot to a different breed of rabbit but understand that I'm getting good stock so that I get a little better feed conversion ratio. Although the best feed conversion ratios from what I understand happen not to be purebreds, but happen to be meat mutts that are kind of crosses of different types of breeds. But again, I, with me wanting to conserve heritage breeds and looking for a little better stock, I wanted to kind of pivot in a bit of a different direction. So if there's one thing that I would tell you, if you decide to get into rabbits, make sure you get as good of stock as you possibly can. Don't just get whatever you can find on Craigslist or whatever your dad drops you off uh, at your house for 10 months. Get what as good of stock as you possibly can um, and, and, and really understand the breeds and that, you know, each different breed has a little bit of benefits and drawbacks. And so my second piece of advice would be to talk to people who have the different breeds and just really get a good feel of, um, of what the different breeds have to offer before you jump into anything. Now, you may want to start like we did with some meat mutts or some New Zealand crosses. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, just to get kind of a feel for rabbits and whether or not you want to go that route uh, before you invest in really high quality top-notch stock. But you do want to go into it with your eyes wide open, talk to people, listen to what they have to say, um, and understand that they probably know what they're talking about if they've been doing it for any le length of time. Um, kind of like me when I rolled my eyes at that guy that rabbits could breed through the, the wire. Uh, they can. <laughs> uh, and another thing to, to keep in mind with rabbits is um, if you're going to be keeping them through the winter, just like anything else, winter watering is a pain. And while you can get waterers that have uh, heaters in them, the cords on them are very, very short because rabbits will chew on anything. And so that does make winter keeping rabbits a little bit more of a challenge. I'm um, not to say that it's impossible. People certainly do it. But if you live in a cold climate, winter watering is a bit of a pain. And we never really found a great setup. We do have, the again, those heated waterers that you can pick up at Tractor Supply. But with those short cords, it's just, it, it just makes it very, very difficult. 
Well, folks, I know this has gone long, but I think this is really, really uh, a great option for many homesteads to raise rabbits for meat. I think that uh, there's just so many benefits to it. It's something that in the future I hope to get back to doing here on our homestead. And if you have any kind of questions with regards to this, reach out to me, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. Um, you can uh, contact us on our Instagram or our Facebook accounts as well. And uh, I would be more than happy to answer any questions uh, or if I've got something wrong and you're somebody who's been raising rabbits for a lot longer than I have and I misspoke, let me know that and I will be glad to offer a correction. All right, that is it for this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. Again, thanks so much for sticking with us. If you haven't already, please jump on over to uh, your favorite podcast player and leave us a review or a thumbs up. Share this with other people. I'm so thankful for those of you who have been with us for a, a while. We passed the 9,000 download mark this week, so thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just very humbled and honored that you would choose to take time out of your day to listen to me. Uh, if you haven't already, check us out. We're on Facebook and Instagram. The links are in the show notes. And also our brand new website, thehomesteadjourney.net, is up. If you want to get in touch with me, again, the best way to do that, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. As always, the music for this episode is provided by audionautics.com, so a big thank you to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.